I'm just going to pause that. So, um, welcome. It's so great to see so many people here. Um, nothing to do with us, everything to do with Jen and Sam um, and the massive draw that they are exercising um, in this space. Um, before we start, I just I do just want to acknowledge the ongoing genocide in Gaza. Uh, I also want to highlight the role of the university and in particular our student communities in holding our governments to account, not just for their complicity, but for their active enablement of the Israeli state. Um, the kids are all right, I think. Uh, I send solidarity to the student protesters at US universities who've been brutalized by the police and reaffirm that destruction of Palestinian universities and killing of scholars. So destroying the history of and capacity for Palestinian knowledge has been a key technique of the genocide. I also want to call your attention to the fact that this is May Day, also known as International Workers' Day. And on this day, over a thousand workers are blockading the UK Trade Department in London and BAE Systems Arms Factories in Scotland, Wales and Lancashire. So all power to them. I'm Ali Phipps. I'm Professor of Sociology at Newcastle University. Um, and I work on sexual violence, among other things. I'm a political sociologist. This seminar is being hosted by the Sociology Department, the Gender Research Group, and the Abolition Feminism for Ending Sexual Violence Collective, which we colloquially call ABFEM. Um, I co organise this collective with Nikki Godden Rasool and Tina Sicker, Nikki is a senior lecturer in law and Tina's a reader in techno science and intersectional justice. And this collective is our little space for more transformative and abolitionist thinking in the academy. Any of you are welcome to join it. I'll send details around after today's talk. And I'm really delighted to introduce Jennifer Nash and Samantha Pinto. Um, they're both huge intellects and our Stacey Gillis, who knows them both, describes them as also being really lovely people. Um, I think huge intellect plus lovely person equals quite rare in academia, and that's perhaps the only equation you'll ever hear from me. So in other words, they're very precious and we need to look after them. Um, as I said, this is the biggest event we've ever done. It was so big, we did have to convert to a webinar. Um, I'm really grateful for their time and for their assistance in helping us break into the big time. Um, so please do bear with us if there are any technical hitches as we go through. Um, drop me a line in the Q&A if there are, and we'll do our best to, to make it work for you. So Jennifer is the Jean Fox O'Barr Professor of Gender, Sexuality and Feminist Studies at Duke. She's the author of four books, most recently How We Write Now, Living with Black Feminist Theory. Samantha Pinto is Director of the Humanities Institute and Professor of English at the University of Texas at Austin. She's the author of Difficult Diasporas and Infamous Bodies. Those are such good titles. I'm rubbish at titles. That are, those are really good. Um, Jen and Sam are going to speak today about feminist exhaustion. Uh, and I think the number of people on the call speaks to them and their reputations and also to the draw of the topic. I don't imagine it's just me that read that title and felt seen. Um, I was particularly struck by the last line of the abstract, which is about moving towards a feminist politics of exhaustion that nonetheless keeps the institutional lights on. Yes, this is absolutely what we need to do. So I'm so looking forward to hearing from them about that. So they'll speak for around 45 minutes and then we'll do questions. It's a text-based Q&A, as you already know. Um, Nikki, Tina and I will collate the questions during the talk and then put them to Jen and Sam afterwards. So we probably won't get through all your questions, but we'll hopefully be able to group them and get more covered that way. So over to you, Jen and Sam, and thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Ali, thank you for the tremendously generous introduction and to all the folks at Newcastle for the invitation and for making this possible, for getting the webinar going and the like. We really appreciate it. Um, Ali, I also, uh, Sam and I appreciate you um, resetting our collective focus on genocide, which certainly forms the backdrop of our thinking today as we want to talk about crisis and the endlessness of crisis. Um, 
and I guess I'll say as last note of introduction, this is, I think for us, a kind of work in progress. We put this together for this talk. And so we're really excited to hear what folks think and to have a conversation. Um, so our working title for this is called On Feminist Exhaustion, Notes from the Field. We have a running joke that we text to each other. It's that kind of joke that isn't a joke. My sexuality is tired. It's a riff on Hannah Goldsby's now memified line from Nanette, I identify as tired. I scripted that line post motherhood, post cross country moves during endless and ongoing professional burnout from administrative work, mentoring, the relentlessness of a job that requires an excessive amount of soft labor alongside the required work of teaching, writing and editing. My sexuality is tired, a way of describing what's lost and what just is in the flow or rather the morass of care work, a way of relating across our separate swamps of care, a way to recognize each other as feminists, as friends who wanna care less, even as we continue to do and to do more institutional, political and personal care labor. It is also a way of speaking back to what has become a dominant feminist demand that sex and sexuality be always political, always radical and transgressive, that nothing is more politically transformative than pleasurable, affirmatively consented to, of course, multi-orgasmic feminist sex. A feminist edict that neglects how much of everyday sex is reaching through the haze of tiredness to say, I remember you, I'm here, we're here. The erotic alongside care has become a perpetual rhetorical life force in queer and feminist theory without thinking about how the everyday work of feminist care sucks out that life force erodes, wears down, and not just because of or against capitalism, but because life, living, caring is exhausting, creating a space where one might be too tired to fuck, too tired to care about fucking, too tired to give any fucks at all. We don't do shift work. We aren't healthcare workers or childcare workers. We aren't city or utility workers or K-12 teachers or members of other pink pro professions that had to keep on caring in person in increasingly complex, always underpaid and understaffed ways during the pandemic. In some ways, the early days of the pandemic gave us a language and a brief, too brief window to see that work and its utter importance. We learned to call it essential work. The pandemic also largely left those essential workers to die without what we came to call PPE and with only the mandate to work on. We are decidedly not heroes in lore or in the order of things, we are dully, clearly in the middle, middle class, mothers, married, mundane, and we identify with each other as tired, as a way to encapsulate our overarching experience of care, not as a calling, a virtue, or even a resource to be redistributed equitably. We don't valorize it as a political method or utopic scene or a radical performance or a non-normative refusal. We sink into its exhaustive morass. We feel it, we wish overwhelmingly not to do it, and yet we must, and we also choose to, to go on. Again, our work and our experience of care work is not special. It's embarrassing normativity engenders decidedly anti-erotic feelings of exhaustion, not just with our institutions, but with our professions, our politics, our colleagues, our students, our lives, ourselves. So this talk seeks to strip the embarrassment as a modifier for that normative exhaustion in order to say to feminist theory and as feminist theorists, we are tired and that is feminist and feminism, not a symptom to be cured and not just the byproduct of a noble, radical, romanticized care. Though we think alongside rather than against theorists of care, self and otherwise. Recent feminist, queer, trans, and sexuality studies work alongside work in Black studies and critical ethnic studies has rested on reevaluating care. Radical care, mutual aid, communities of care, care away from the family unit, the medical industrial complex, the state, capitalism, and other infrastructural sites of remedy, remediation, restoration, and repair. While we welcome this revaluation of, core, of a core feminist tenant and its recovery from dismissal because of CARE's feminization, we seek to rethink the generative role of exhaustion in feminist theory and feminist institutional practice in these theories. As Hihile Hobart defines it, quote, 
Radical care is a set of vital but underappreciated strategies for enduring precarious worlds. While radical care is often connected to positive political change by providing spaces of hope in dark times, it is inseparable from systemic inequality and power structures. It can be used to coerce subjects into new forms of surveillance and unpaid labor to make up for institutional neglect and even to position some groups against others, determining who is worthy of care and who is not. Even so, in the face of state-sanctioned violence, economic crisis, and impending ecological collapse, collective care offers a way forward." End quote. We want to focus on the exhaustion acknowledged by feminist, queer, and trans care theorists as our objects here before the even so of Hobart's quote, that turn in the last sentence that I read. Hill Malatino's theory of what begets a turn to trans care in particular is motivated for being in, in a, an exhausting logic of misrecognition and yet still remaining recognition dependent, saying, quote, this means that we labor under conditions we don't choose, conditions that many of us actively want to destroy, end quote. Malatino posits care as a bare bones of practice, of doing, that comes out of both this experience of dependence on recognition and the necessity to act against it. Quote, this work, like all care work, is about fostering survival. It is maintenance work that must be done so that trans folks can get about the work of living. But the mere necessity of this work also points to the fact that the most fundamental networks of care that enable us to persist in our existence are often threadbare or sometimes nearly non-existent, end quote. Chris Hansman capaciously thinks of care in their new book through strategic reorientations for care around need. So away from a pathology of desire and toward a necessity to quote, survive and to thrive, end quote as it is articulated by the person who needs the care, not centered by or on the person giving it, or on a universal theory of identity categories, while remaining wary of the utilization of informed consent and self-determination to do so. So we pivot to the exhaustion inherent in the necessity of caring and on the folks who do care work and the words that travel with it, including tending, attending to, offering attention in feminist theory. Our anti, as in before, A-N-T-E, rather than anti, um, utopic theory of exhaustion, is attempting to theorize and meet femini feminism where it is and where we are in our self-determined administrative eras. We are tired from the political moment we are in, one marked by multiple intersecting catastrophes, by genocidal global politics and the militarization of campuses. We are tired from burnout on every level from the so-called corporate university to the endless demands of care from students, colleagues, aging parents, and our young children, and exhausted by the impossibility of doing it all and doing it right in the ever-shifting landscape of institutional, personal, and political solvency. We also want to acknowledge from inside of the house of US and Western academic feminism, the demands of having a body that my sexuality is tired, what we started with suggests. Keeping a body going amidst being an adult, being a parent, being an academic, servicing students, and the demands of left political purity and ideological certainty that persist in our institutional milieus, including the exhaustive search for an inexhaustible object, name, or theory that can and will do it all inside of feminism. This theory that centers exhaustion in feminist thought isn't meant to be totalizing for all subjects, but instead one we should consider especially as feminist institutionality ages. What is it that keeps feminism going? Caring feminists face the political pressures to always have our actions align with our politics, which are imagined to be easily identifiable at all times, 
even as we keep the institutional resources and bureaucracies flowing while addressing every unfolding crisis by speaking an assumed uh, easily identifiable truth to power. The present demands of feminist consistent ideological alignment with abolition and intersectionality, for example, even when life often reveals itself to be deeply complicated and uncertain in ways that make the application of theories of justice messier than we often theorize, renders the everyday and exhausting act of negotiating and maneuvering using the master's tools, Audre Lorde's infamous uh, construction, all while disavowing them. We are exhausted with and from our intersectional feminism, which is also about a certain demand for an all encompassing care within our work, that we care for all feminist objects in all ways, all at once, and to do so, to not do so, is an abandonment of feminist praxis and ethics. In this talk, we'll explore what a turn away from care and toward a feminist politics of exhaustion that nonetheless keeps the institutional lights on might look like as investment rather than just divestment from feminist labor. Feminist care and caring might also be thought as self-annihilating for the sake of reproducing the field. We are trying here to make that teleology visible by tracing a history of feminist writing on exhaustion that includes but also goes beyond white feminism, decrying the care work of private family and social reproduction. What is a feminist theory of exhaustion? One that stays with the exhaustion and acts from it rather than theorizes itself against fatigue's toll. We don't seek to curtail the revolutionary archive and present of feminist theorizing and revaluation of care, including feminist theorists like Nancy Chodero, Adrian Rich and Shulamith Firestone, Black studies scholars like Christina Sharp, whose concept of, of anti-Blackness as the weather has been so important, feminist Marxist utopias like Sylvia Federici's Wages Against Housework, Sophie Lewis's Full Surrogacy Now, Alexis Pauline Gums on Revolutionary Mothering, and theorists of mutual aid, some of whom Sam already mentioned. We also recognize the important intervention of popular feminist writers who center self-care, like Trisha Hersey, who tells us that rest is resistance, and Sonia Renee Taylor, who tells us that our bodies must stop apologizing. We love to see the feminist imaginations at work to reimagine and redefine care away from routinization and capitalism, trying to find a way to, to trying to find a way to seek one's freedom and cultivate one's desires through a collective, mutual, and more equitable economy of care. But in exhausted responses to these imaginings, we seek a pause from the work of care and strategies for remaking it, refusing it, resisting its protocols, to sit with what is in feminism, exhaustion. Christina Sharp's blockbuster Black feminist classic in the wake coins a theory of exhaustion of a kind, the weather, the conditions of anti-Blackness, which are so regular as to be unremarkable, which may shift, but which persist. This particular theory of the erosion of life energy from the experience of caring for, through, and in the wake of anti-Blackness is one that is about living in and through exhaustion, through being made tired in the acute conditions of modernity. We might also want to gesture here to Arlene Geronimus's work on weathering, which captures how racism exhausts the body at a cellular level, leaving Black people prematurely aged, so that, as Geronimus notes, quote, you become chronologically old at a young age. We seek not to dilute this condition of exhaustion into banal universality, but instead to think through a Black feminist theory of exhaustion as a shared acknowledgement of the exhausted labor of living and caring while tired, not trying to find in it something redeemable or escapable or redistributable, but instead as recognizable as the conditions of being a subject. This seems bleak, to be sure, but we insist on it here as a politics of the feminist present that imagines precarity and interdependence, exhaustion, 
as a shared norm amongst many, rather than imagining we will all ascend to the rights bearing autonomy to rights bearing autonomy from a state of lack, a state of moving from caring to being cared for by the state and by the social contract. Exhaustion is a feminist state as well as a feminist feeling. It is perhaps a feminist condition. In this talk, we ask, what does it mean to do feminism through this effective lens rather than against it or with a recipe for its affective reanimation through acknowledgement or a revolutionary frontier? What does feminism look like if we sit with and think with exhaustion as a feminist mode of feeling political, of doing politics? What if we weren't sure that there was a feminist life, a living beyond wokeness, that there wasn't a feminist or that there wasn't a feminist erotics, intimacy, kin, or community that exists beyond exhaustion or beyond labor? What if the feminized normative mode of exhaustion was the condition of being in an intersectional feminist world rather than the yoke we can slip no matter how much we yearn or ache to? In this talk, we begin to map out an attachment to exhaustion that first traces a partial genealogy of feminist thinking on and with tiredness rather than against it. And second, imagines what we do and might do with feminist exhaustion as a theory in feminist research and as a praxis in feminist institutional life. We end by thinking about what it might mean to fuck with care, to reorient it, reimagine it, and, and reimagine it through a politics and a theory of feminist exhaustion rather than the other way around. So the first section of the talk is called Archives of Exhaustion Without Relief. In the beginning pages of Patricia J. Williams's masterpiece, The Alchemy of Race and Rights from 1991, Williams insists that her readers meet her where she is, since in her words, quote, subject position is everything in my analysis of the law. We find her as she describes herself, quote, in an old Terry bathrobe with a little fringe of blue and white tassels dangling from the hem, trying to decide if she is stupid or crazy. The world is falling apart. Williams is, quote, very depressed. And she tells us that, quote, conditions are bad, very bad all over the world. In the midst of what she calls the panic of this deadly world, she tells us that it, it can be hard to find what to write or even why to write, and certainly hard to discern what writing does to make sense of the conditions of the present. We wanna sit with the detail that grounds Williams's analysis of law, the bathrobe with a torn fringe of Terry bluebells that she wears while her computer is atop her knees. What does it mean to ground one's analysis of law in the bathrobe, or to be more specific, the bathrobe worn during the day? The sartorial symbol of deep exhaustion, of retreat from the public and the erotic world. Indeed, exhaustion is a through line in the alchemy of race and rights. From Williams's description of her teaching evaluations, where her students note that she, quote, appears tired all the time and talks as if I'm on speed, to Williams's own fatigue with a legal canon that mirrors a dominant culture where, quote, Children are taught not to see what they see, by which Blacks are reassured that there is no real inequality in the world, just their own bad dreams, and by which women are taught not to experience what they experience in deference to men's ways of knowing." End quote. We begin here with a feminist theory forged in the bathrobe, or maybe a feminist theory of the bathrobe, one that acknowledges not only the exhausting conditions of the world, but the exhaustion that is part of enduring, of living on, and living on in terrible times, in the midst of the collapse of public life, of higher education, of democracy. We start with Williams, who refuses to pull herself together, who insists that we see her where she is, in a kind of madness, her words, produced by the world itself. The bathrobe is, as Lamar Bruce indicates in his work, a symbol of how to, quote, go mad without losing your mind, and also a call to theorize from the exhausted position, 
to treat it as a subject position worth beginning an analysis from. Much of the feminist response to the exhausted position has been to proliferate theories and practices of alternative care, to argue that we need to care more, to share the work of care, to celebrate and champion care as an anti-state mode of ensuring collective survival. Saidiya Hartman famously described care as the quote, antidote to violence. And Christina Sharp called care the central problem for black thought, insisting that quote, I wanna distinguish what I am calling and calling for as care from state imposed regimes of surveillance. She continues, how can we think and rethink and rethink care laterally in the register of the intramural in a different relation than that of the violence of the state? In his celebration of care, Joshua Chambers, Latson noted, quote, under conditions like these, survival isn't merely a drive, it's an imperative. It is a command to stay close to each other and take care of each other because we need each other in order to stay alive with each other. What we've got when there's nothing else, not even the feeling of freedom, is our flesh, life, and each other. In some ways, the notion of care as an urgent and life-saving practice is an enduring preoccupation of Black feminist thought from Audre Lorde's reminder that, quote, caring for myself is not self-indulgence, it is self-preservation, and that is an act of political warfare, end quote, to Alice Walker's now canonical conception of the womanist as a figure who retreats periodically for health. Even as care has been championed, scholars have emphasized how institutionalized care always falls short of its promise, highlighting what anthropologist Samina Mala has called the violence of care, or what Rodante Vanderwall describes as, quote, a discrepancy between what we imagine care to be and how care is practiced, given that our most important institutions of care perpetuate various forms of violence, end quote. Care thus is hailed as anti-institutional if it is truly to be care, a practice of attention, of tending to, of regarding, of mutuality and relationality that circumvents the juridical, the bureaucratic, the administrative, the, patho the pathological, instead ushering us into webs of entanglement and mutuality. As Joanna Hedva notes, quote, care is an exchange. The words caretaker and caregiver mean the same thing. We must give it as we take it. The project of becoming an individual on one's own terms has no room for care, for being careful with each other. And while there have been critiques of care, they have been centered on the tendency to devalue care, largely because it's, it's women's work, and so we can think of the long tradition of feminist critiques there, and to instead suggest that we need to revalue and ungender care or share care better. Or these critiques have focused on institutions that promise care, say the hospital or the university, and that instead extend logics of carcerality and practices of harm. It's no surprise that the call for care intensified in 2020 as mutual aid became the primary means for collective survival, as the state retreated from its responsibility to care for its citizens, and as the world watched police officer Derek Chauvin murder George Floyd on a Minneapolis street. It was care that was called upon to keep life livable, to allow for us to live on. This call for care proliferated even as the media regularly depicted the exhaustion of those juggling the multiple care responsibilities that largely came to be located in the home. And here again, we recognize that for so many essential workers, these caring responsibilities were felt in the hospital and the supermarket and sanitation facilities and warehouses and ports and so on. But we in here were talking about us and ourselves. We were called to care more as our living rooms became offices, as our kitchen tables became schools for our children. We were called to care more despite the reports of pervasive fatigue, including the rising number of Americans who now describe fatigue and brain fog, often from long COVID, as, dis as transforming their lives. One New York Times article reported that, quote, at the start of 2020, a survey estimated that there were fewer than 15 million Americans age 18 to 64 with any kind of disability. That rose to about 16.5 million by September 2023. A year after the start of the pandemic, Deb Perlman took to the New York Times op-ed page to tell readers that during the pandemic, one could have children or a job 
but not both. Everyone was far too stretched thin, far too mired in the endless demands to care. She noted, quote, the consensus is that everyone agrees this is a catastrophe, but we are too bone tired to raise our voices above a groan, let alone scream through a megaphone. Every single person confesses burnout, despair, feeling like they're losing their minds, knowing in their guts that this is untenable, end quote. For Perelman, the pandemic was a lesson in feminist economics. The pandemic drove women from the labor force, left us burdened with household and caregiving responsibilities. Homeschooling was generally women's work. One New York Times poll found that half of fathers with children under 12 reported spending more time on it than their partners did, but 80% of mothers said that they spent more time on it. We know that the lockdown did nothing to, to remedy the gender division of labor, with 70% of women reporting that they were fully or mostly responsible for housework. All around us was evidence of the fundamental instability of childcare, even for middle-class and affluent parents in the US. As those of us with children know all too well, all it takes is a few sick days for the tenuous balance of work and life to collapse. And here again, I'm describing the lives of those of us who can afford childcare, who can afford so-called flexibility with our schedules. Perelman highlights how damn tired the pandemic made us, it continues to make us, how the collapse of someplace called work and home and school rendered life one big workplace, marked by the demands to keep up on email and meals, homework and exercise to just keep going. The call for more care and the urgent necessity of care had briefly reinvigorated a feminist conversation about the costs of care, particularly for women, and the feeling of being bone tired. But where we were left was with, was with care being individual, invisible, devalued labor, and with radical scholars continuing to champion care as necessary to imagining another kind of feminist world. So I'll, we will return to Williams now to, um, to assemble a feminist archive of exhaustion that might illuminate this tension between a normative and a radical feminist politics of care. Williams doesn't find sucker from um, intramural care, a turn inward to ask for responsibility of the state to now belong to minoritized feminist communities of care. She imagines instead continuing work from the place of exhaustion, and she begins to theorize the work that exhaustion does that comes out of and through exhaustion rather than in spite of it. Other archives of feminist exhaustion, here creative, explicitly think about this toggle of the thwarted search for care from within political communities in response to the violence of white, patriarchal, and state organizations of life meant to exhaust in particular ways, some of which are reproduced in the history and conditions of the constant, relentlessly feminized care work that is necessary for the social reproduction of life. It's not coincidental that we look at narrative forms um, in the above or in what follows as we argue that feminist exhaustion is a theory of accumulation and a long temporality rather than the constant eruption of the next crisis in a left politics that increasingly articulates its value in the currency of urgency. If Williams begins her story of Black feminist theory from the position of exhaustion, Nella Larson's 1928 novel Quicksand starts in the shine of youthful vitality as protagonist Helga Crane attempts to navigate the dynamic political landscape of Pan-African era politics, stretching from HBCUs in the U.S. South, New York race organization machines like the NAACP, it's a proxy for it in the novel, and European high culture, trying to find political direction and to satisfy her personal and libidinal desires in and through the limited political economy for Black women subjects on these scenes. Tracking through ongoing feminist and feminine frustration with forms of political articulation and organizing for Black life, as well as financial and sexual disappointment in the wake of becoming an eroticized object from both the black and the white male gaze, quicksand winds down in the protagonist's bed. 
Crane's journey to Southern religious wifedom and motherhood and genteel poverty is afforded by a punctum in the text, trudging through the glamorous worlds of black political and cultural life that she coveted, Crane suddenly gives up and gives in, exhausted from following political and personal desires that are curtailed and thwarted, she turns toward normative exhaustion as a solution to desire. Quote, after the first exciting months, Helga was too driven, too occupied, and too sick to carry out any of the things for which she had made such enthusiastic plans, or even to care that she had made only slight progress toward their accomplishment. For she, who had never thought of her body save as something on which to hang lovely fabrics, had now constantly to think of it. It had persistently to be pampered, to secure from it even a little service. Always, she felt extraordinarily and annoyingly ill, having forever to be sinking into chairs, or if she was out, to be pausing by the roadside, clinging desperately to some convenient fence or tree, waiting for the horrible nausea and hateful faintness to pass. The light, carefree days of the past, when she had not felt heavy and reluctant or weak and spent, receded more and more with increasing vagueness, like a dream passing from a faulty memory. The children used her up. They, there were already three of them, all born within a short space of 20 months. How, she wondered, did other women, other mothers manage? Could it be possible that, while presenting such smiling and contented faces, they were all always on the edge of health? all always worn out and apprehensive? Or was it only she, a poor, weak, city-bred thing who felt that the strain of what the Reverend Mr. Pleasant Green had so often gently and patiently reminded her was a natural thing, an act of God, was almost unendurable? End quote. For those of us who, or those of us who have experienced caring, parenthood, teaching, administration, elder care, uncompensated or compensated care labor, might feel this deeply, being personally used up and wondering about the widespread exhaustion of a collective feminized population. What does it mean to keep going through what is, quote, almost unendurable, end quote, as the normative quotidian state of life? What does it mean to keep going in exhaustion, not without complaint, but too exhausted to always complain? Larson too imagines the feeling of exhaustion that gives way to faith in another part of the text. Um, and for the interest of time, I will, uh, I will cut this uh, quote, um, but to say that she says, um, faith was really quite easy. One only had to yield. The more weary, the more weak she became, the easier it was. Is feminist theory our religion or supposed to be around care work in the movement and in every moment? Analogizing here movement politics and religious faith as similar explanatory mechanisms that offer a reason to keep caring through exhaustion is uncomfortable partially because it exposes the undergirding structure of even radical care theory as reproducing rationalizations of feminized care work protocols under different animating ethics. So how would this feminism through exhaustion belong to us or not? What would it mean to feel nothing for feminism even after and as one labors for it, as one claims it as one's own? Take the accumulation of Crane's exhaustions at the end of the novel as a case and a thesis. Quote, and when, after that long frightfulness, the fourth little dab of amber humanity, which Helga had contributed to a despised race, was held before her for maternal approval, she failed entirely to respond properly to the sop of consolation for the suffering and horror through which she had passed. There was from her no pleased, proud smile, no loving, possessive gesture, no manifestation of interest in the important matters of sex and weight. Instead, she deliberately closed her eyes, mutely shutting out the sickly infant, its smiling father, the soiled midwife, the curious neighbors, and the tousled room. 
A week she lay so, silent and listless, listless, ignoring food, the clamoring children, the comings and goings of solicitous, kind-hearted women, her hovering husband, and all of life about her. The neighbors were puzzled. The Reverend Mr. Pleasant Green was worried. The midwife was frightened." End quote. Feminist exhaustion here befuddles and scares the community of affinity. Larson writes through a feminism not of dreams of sustained relief, but of the ease of giving up on caring. Where freedom dreaming, commodity fetishism, fantasies of escape, and just, the materi just materially of more sleep are but technologies that, quote, let time run on. Uh, and here again, I'll sort of um, skip over some of the other relentless descriptions of wanting sleep. Uh, and a dreaming of escape uh, here in the interest of time. Um, so, uh, and then it ends with, quote, and hardly had she left her bed and become able to walk again without pain, hardly had the children returned from the homes of the neighbors when she began to have her fifth child, end quote. And that's the end of the text. So there's no teleology out of the plot of feminist exhaustion here, relentlessly so in the pace of the paragraphs and the accumulated weight of longing and material reality that undoes any hope for the reader as it maps out the trap of Crane's fictional embodied existence. Understanding the impulse to imagine a horizon of what Hobart calls non-hierarchical care, Larson's relentless pursuit of the experience of feminist political and personal fatigue, fatigue from the work of care and from the wild failed desires for sustained personal fulfillment and political freedom is instructive here in its modes of refusing a utopic horizon post exhaustion. The demands of living with and among others, of caring and having to care for others never end. Helga is in a, in a word ambivalent about much that we might mind political organizing, charity, sexual pleasure, the marriage market, commodity culture, motherhood, religious ecstasy. She longs not for care, but for less choice and less demand. Works such as Bucci Emicheta's 1979, The Joys of Motherhood, written in the wake of decolonization, similarly thinks through the labor of care and the experience of feminist exhaustion within the promise of black community and state making. This ambivalence about freedom dreaming through exhaustion is not just about the world that anti-Blackness and, and patriarchy produce, but also about the experience of caring and of having to care of the fact of having a body that cares. It is constitutive of being with others or making community, of being in the wake of making and managing and caring for community. Take the much written about presence of baby subs in bed, in flashbacks of Toni Morrison's magnum opus, Beloved, considering color on demand. Quote, baby Suggs didn't even raise her head. From her sick bed, she heard them go, but that wasn't the reason she lay still. Suspended between the nastiness of life and the meanness of the dead, she couldn't get interested in leaving life or living it, let alone the fright of two creeping off boys. Her past had been like her present, intolerable, and since she knew death was anything but forgetfulness, she used the little energy left for her left her for pondering color. Bring a little lavender in if you got any, pink if you don't, end quote. Baby Suggs, having experienced the intolerability of enslavement and motherhood under enslavement, breaks after the disappointment of having rebuilt through black community and feeling that community, that free community turn on her in the ultimate moment of need. In a far different vein, but similar spirit of Kaima Glover's self-interested protagonist in a regarded self, Baby Suggs' administrative work, caring for the black community and offering up resources, even abundance, spiritually and materially, leave her finally and in the wake of extraordinary white violence, exhausted beyond movement or normative engagement. Her own known exhaustion becomes much later instructive on a reflective community who is also tired. Quote, my marrow is tired, he thought, 
I've been tired all my days, bone tired, but it's, but now it's in my marrow. Must be what baby Suggs felt when she lay down and thought about color for the rest of her life. And I'll skip some of this for now um, and skip over to, uh, okay, she just up and quit. By the time Setha was released, she had exhausted blue and was well on her way to yellow. He believed then that shame put her in bed. Now, eight years after her contentious funeral and 18 years after the misery, he changed his mind. Her marrow was tired and it was a testimony to the heart that fed it was, <clears throat> was it took eight years to meet finally the color she was hankering after. The onslaught of her fatigue like his was sudden, but it lasted for years. After 60 years of losing children to the people who chewed up her life and spit it out like a fishbone, after five years of freedom given to her by her last child who bought her future with his, exchanged it, so to speak, so she could have one, whether he did or not, to lose him too, to acquire a daughter and grandchildren and see that daughter slay the children, to try to, to belong to a community of other free, and I won't read the word, but Toni Morrison uses it, um, to love and be loved by them, to counsel and be counseled, protect and be protected, feed and be fed, and then to have that community step back and hold itself at a distance, well, it could wear out even a baby Suggs, holy, end quote. This reflection on the fatigue, on and of fatigue from a member of the community that benefited from baby Suggs's care is on the care work that produces both a sudden burnout and a slow burning exhaustion that carries on and also carries less as it goes on. It is in many ways Morrison's internal treatise on the work of shepherding others through institutional and community life. Though the teleology of the book, Beloved's Plot, imagines a re-energized body and body politic, Baby Suggs starts the book and haunts its narrative as much as the literal haunt of the title. Taken with Williams and Larson, Morrison adds to a genealogy of feminist exhaustion with care that challenges charges of the anti-intersectional foci on white feminist grievances against uncompensated care work. Black feminism has found room to imagine structural exhaustion beyond and including the personal and familial, an accumulation of fatigue that begets feminist subjectivity and even collectives that don't look or feel robust, energizing, or future facing. They don't even look or feel sustainable. Uh, so this section of the talk is called Exhausted Analytics, and it's a case study that focuses on intersectionality. In the height of the global women's marches that followed Donald Trump's 2016 election, an image galvanized feminist politics in the United States. Angela Peoples went to the DC Women's March with a handwritten sign that said, quote, don't forget, white women voted for Trump. And it was the image of her holding the sign that went viral. In the photograph that appeared days later in the New York Times, the Washington Post, on social media and elsewhere, people stands alone with her sign. Behind her are three white women wearing so-called pussy hats, each seemingly absorbed by capturing the energy of the march on their phones. Two are texting, one is taking a selfie. They were donned in pink, and as people's signs suggested, unaware of how their people had carried the election for Trump. And we use that term to think about how much in 2016 you would hear phrases like, white women, come get your people. Journalist Ali Adastagir described the photograph as a, quote, big deal, and noted, quote, to many, the now viral image of a sober looking Angela Peoples and the blithe faces of the white women behind her epitomize a divide between white women and black women that was unmistakable in the 2016 election. She continued, more than 53% of white women voted for Donald Trump, while nearly 94% of black women voted for Hillary Clinton. The split signals how these groups experience sexism and oppression differently, end quote. In December, 2017, 11 months after the photograph was taken, Peoples herself published an editorial in the New York Times and they reproduced the, the photograph again. And she wrote, quote, my message stood in stark contrast to the theme of togetherness that dominated the women's march. 
the pink pussy hats and girl power placards and chants about how women would lead the resistance. This was exactly the point. I made the sign to communicate that in a world where 53% of white women voters choose a racist, elitist, sexual predator for president, the idea that we all want the same thing is a myth. The point was not to antagonize the Women's March participants, who were mostly white. Rather, I wanted to highlight that on a national level, white women are not unified in opposition to Trumpism and can't be counted on to fight it." End quote. Though People's Assign never mentioned intersectionality, it was taken as a visible symbol of the Women's March's pitfalls and promise, itself now an exhausted topic of study. The photograph was a sign of the kind of feminism imagined to be necessary to contend with the challenges of the present, intersectionality. Intersectionality, imagined to be embodied by Black women, was the opposite of white feminism, something that Sam and I have written about elsewhere, embodied by white women. Intersectionality was thought to be taking politics seriously. It was what is commonly called doing the work, and white feminism was not. Intersectionality was imagined as the only way to save feminism from its own collapse, from a feminism that could never actually be feminism. That was, as Rachel Carvel noted, white supremacy in heels. As Peoples indicated in that same New York Times editorial, the work of the left, she felt, should be to follow Black women. And she noted, quote, we don't need thanks. We need you to get out of the way and follow our lead. Since 2016, intersectionality has been moved onto a global stage as the single and perhaps only promising feminist approach to seemingly everything. As right-wing attempts to eliminate critical race theory from curriculum across the educational spectrum proliferate, intersectionality promises a left audience that it won't fail them in this or future moments of critique, that it will keep going, keep getting it right for us and keep fighting the good fight that the limits of a white branded feminism can't and couldn't accommodate. While people's sign is often hailed as evidence of the need for intersectional feminism, we also want to think about it as an icon of exhaustion. Indeed, people's image could be taken as evidence of a story that has long tracked intersectionality and black feminist theory, that it is a theory played by fatigue. What happens, so many asked anxiously, if even the election of a violent misogynist can't unite feminists together under the mantle of intersectional feminism? Intersectionality's real or imagined demand for a left project that could think Islamophobia, transphobia, carcerality, misogyny, and anti-Blackness simultaneously, that refused the icon of the pussy hat, offered a vision, utopic or apocalyptic, of a left movement that centers the multiply marginalized and that thinks across multiple forms of violence and their intersections. And this has always seemed hard for feminists, exhausting even. This was a political vision that many found and still find to be impossible, even as many find it desirable. And the movement sign with its call for an intersectional feminism that is not bullshit to riff on the uh, now infamous quote, my feminism will be intersectional or it will be bullshit can be interpreted as representing a desire for an impossible object, a feminism that could never be simply because it is required to hold so much for so many all at the same time. As we name the ways that intersectionality is often thought to engender feminist fatigue, or at the very least to trouble feminist cohesiveness, it is not to be clear that we think intersectionality lacks analytical teeth. Though I think we would suggest that the moments that we're in um, reveal the need for a panoply of feminist tools to understand the conditions of the present, not just a tool. Instead, we want to foreground a still prevalent sense that intersectionality is imagined as exhausting in its political demands for a feminism that can attend to everything. In other words, intersectionality is imagined both to rejuvenate feminism, we need intersectionality to save ourselves, but also to exhaust feminism, because intersectionality is a horizon something we can never quite reach, a demand for a capacious feminism that we have not yet been able to imagine. Intersectionality is regularly imagined as a goal, an end that we're always wor working towards. Our analyses and politics should endeavor always to be more intersectional, and thus intersectionality is a place where we never will arrive. We might also think about the endless policing around intersectionality as evidence of the analytic as exhausting, 
the anxiety that it generates, which few other terms do, we might think for those of us um, who teach either at the undergraduate or the graduate level about how often the question around intersectionality is, can I use this in my work? Am I using it okay? Is it right? A set of questions that have not plagued other feminist theories like transnationalism or the idea of gender as a performance. We might also think about the pervasive sense that intersectionality is the only right tool for doing feminist work and that all feminist work has to cover all minoritized subjects at all times or the most minoritized subjects at all times to meet the litmus test of intersectionality. The collapse of academic and professional work with the personal and political feminist work of care is illustrated as an unthought virtue in intersectional policing where being a feminist demands that you give and do all of the things at once or you will be cast out of its ranks and its circle of ethical subjectivity. This ubiquitous unquestioned distribution of intersectionality as a governing logic often uses care as an alibi and takes exhaustion as both its price and the symptom of everything it's not rather than the work it itself demands. So um, this is our concluding section, um, which we call administering exhaustion toward a politics of feminist exhaustion. Um, in Rod Ferguson's article, Administering Sexuality, he meditates on the politics of doing academic administration and institution building for, in the name of and with the history of queer and feminist theory. He reminds us that Foucault argues against the repressive hypothesis that power also says yes, and then imagines what it means to be both the recipient of that yes and the wielder of it. As we are deep into feminism's administrative era now, and as Jen has written about, we are in a particular era where Black feminism has a certain amount of power it is uncomfortable claiming and even disavows. We write from a different place a place of exhaustion with the care demanded of left political feminist work as always already both inside and outside of institutional power, where administrators of academic feminism must endlessly care for everyone while and by keeping the field going, reproducing it and future scholars of the field against the power that wants to shut it down, water it down, appropriate it, censor it, claim it for itself and disavow it at the same time. We are to view this care as noble and virtuous, but also as complicit, not enough, the least we could do as tenured chairs and directors. We are to view our own resources and power as endlessly redistributed if we cared enough, well enough, which we can never do. I should say redistributable, if we cared enough, well enough, which we can never do. Our care is demanded to solve the problems of minoritized precarity in all of their forms. In the endless game of not it, of who will be, in cha be chair or in charge, we should feel bad about wielding power, disavow holding it, and step aside for others whose identities are more precarious to lead, even as we know that administrative work is gutting and relentless, and in the case of many Black women, fatal, uh, and exhausting. We are speaking today in the midst of a concerted attack on higher education by right-wing and neoliberal targeted campaigns. We've watched that rhetoric of liberal indoctrination create a culture of reactionary administration looking to preemptively counter these accusations by militarized response, backed by its claims to resist the proposed duration of protest speech and the rhetoric of liberal personal securitization. Encampments and tents are not safe spaces in these rhetorics and folks who disagree with the protest speech won't quote, feel safe on campus, end quote, in again, in administrative rhetoric. In response, we as in professional feminists, I will call us, draft the ubiquitous open letters to our, open, to our own administrations. We show up to witness and to document and to document ourselves witnessing student-led political action in the name of the care that we that <clears throat> we say our left identified fields demand and demand that we perform endlessly for each unfolding crisis and for this era of endless global intersectional crises. We feel exhausted even as we watch and hope for the seemingly indefatig indefatigable youth of those encamped and for an end to one modern genocide among many. 
we as professional feminists feel the need to offer and administrate from a place of physical, emotional, and institutional care as our field's birthright, as our responsibility. What if we say as feminists, we are exhausted by everyday life and forms of living through care, even as we do it, that we might long for distance, for less soft emotional management, for continuing on with a feminism that is less emotionally charged, intertwined, even rigorous in its care work and its caring about care work, especially as it is articulated as a series of disjointed crises and choices in individual moments, rather than through the exhausting logics of accumulation and endurance. How do you continue on with care work while acknowledging that it's also shit work, that you'll get fucked or not from doing it, that it will drain you, sap you, that it is the antithesis antithesis of autonomy and rights, and that it is exhausting and vulnerable and messy and failing. This is maintenance feminism, a feminism that says, as we did in an earlier title for this piece, fuck care, a feminist theory that fucks with care, not by refusing or disavowing, nor by radicalizing it. This is a feminism that keeps the lights on, but does not valorize the project of reproducing feminist institutionalization or life in perpetuity. This is exhaustion that doesn't hide the labor or the affect under which feminism operates by the self or the writ of virtuous self or field reproduction. We are willing to show how feminism is self-annihilating like Williams, like Larson, like Morrison, like myriad feminist authors and theorists of quotidian feminized life without a theory of recovery politically or personally. Feminist exhaustion may or may not care to the point of self-annihilation, but as a theory, it refuses to make care a necessary sacrifice to the altar of feminism as an unquestioned energizing good, or even claim feminism as a space for momentary respite or pleasure. It keeps going until it can't. If it refuses anything, it is the logic of professional reproduction as an unquestioned moral and political good that demands and deserves care. We think about the turn to care in radical feminist and queer spaces as a way to try to assimilate the normative of daily living and daily life with others back into feminist theory while ungendering it away from the dullness and monotony of feminist exhaustion. A feminist theory of exhaustion or a feminist exhaustion moves toward rather than away from the normative feminine as our field, disciplinary and in terms of our object of study, our field work, our daily geography and context. Rather than seeing cis hat white women in the nuclear family as tired dupes from the 1950s, we theorize them as us as folks building within a system that is always structurally, conceptually, practically exhausting and meant to exhaust them in other very basic ways. This exhausting social reproduction is both something that they and we choose and don't choose, a structure that we are of even as we are exhausted by its demands, its responsibilities, the way it forces attention to the thriving and sustaining of the life of others and our discipline against our own desires, wild and otherwise, against ourselves and even our bodies without relief or cure. We think exhaustion as a key underexplored way to think feminism as and through the exhaustion of care in myriad forms and from myriad forces, including from inside of the field, but focusing on the exhaustion and not the care. We are exhausted from feminism, but decidedly not taking what Janet Halley called a break from its demands. Instead, we are doing it tired. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Um, that was so amazingly rich. And um, just for everybody watching, I will upload the video with captions um, and I will edit them so all of the citation names are correct as well. So you can follow up on some of the citations um, because there was so much in that. So I think that everybody will want to return to it. Um, and I definitely did feel seen as I was expecting to, especially as a senior colleague who's also positioned institutionally as a bottomless pit of care. Um, and sometimes you have to dig quite deep, don't you? Um, so it was like a breath of fresh air for me. Thank you. Uh, we already have one question in the Q&A. Please do put your questions in the Q&A now, everyone. Um, but Tina, do you have an opening question and then we can go into our other questions? Yeah, um, and and again, I just want to reiterate uh, what Allison said. That was so rich and generative. Um, 
I'm finding myself sort of drawn in a bunch of different ways. And we've got some questions coming in and do put it um, into the um, Q&A if you want me to, to do it. We've got some uh, lined up, but just as a starting um, question, perhaps we can talk a little bit about the experience. Um, and this is something that Alison actually wrote down, which I thought was really interesting. Um, how to embrace being exhausted uh, as, as someone in whatever situation you're in um, and say no and refuse to pull oneself together, but also be a good colleague. I think there is this sense that we're, we're all kind of exhausted in our own situations with so much on our plates, but then also wanting to support um, our colleagues and the people around us, um, just how to, to kind of navigate that or to coordinate that. Sam, I can say, I'll say something. Yeah, I think, it, I mean, I think it's a great question and it's, I think, a hard challenge that's navigated and negotiated on an everyday basis. I think one of the things that um, Sam and I have both tried to think about in our respective institutions where, as you all are describing, we're all incredibly stretched in all the time, is how can we upend some of the norms of academic life that are so baked in that are actually deeply exhausting. So for example, um, at my institution, probably like many of yours, we have a lot of events at night. These are, <laughs> that's exhausting. And for many of us who have um, small kids, it means trading off on childcare, securing babysitters, missing bedtime. It just becomes untenable. And so thinking about like, hey, we are all in the office from nine to five. So why don't we have events at lunch? Like that's a, you know, like just trying to think more um, strategically about time. So, because I think what often happens is like being a good departmental citizen means showing up after 5 p.m. three times a week and hiding the fact that you have a kid or kids at home or bringing your kid with you and putting them on their Kindle while you try to do the things that you're doing. When actually, I think one of the things that we're trying to think about is like, how can we actually change the way that we structure time in our units um, to, to, to just yeah, be more mindful of the multiple demands that people are facing. So that's a sort of a first thought. Sam, I don't know if you wanted to jump in. And I think the other thing, so I'd say two things, even as you know, we're clearly not offering a solution and being like, this is ongoing, but in other ways, um, uh, as an administrator, um, setting limits on what not just you can do, but then um, what you could ask others to do. So I often say it's a lot easier for me um, to work with sort of our staff and think, how can I not make them be here after five? How can I make them not have endless hours and hours of work and overcommit them through my own commitments, right? And so it's often hilariously easier for me to think like an exhausted feminist for others rather than for myself. But that hopefully um, is also a no that you could build in structurally around being like, I'm not gonna ask that of other people. So why am I asking that of myself, et cetera? Um, and so part of it is that. And the other thing that I think is really hard, and this is, I wanna think about this at a theoretical affect level, as well as like a, a joke that, self-help in middle age, like is for women, uh, people identified as women is not uh, about relationships. Instead, it's about like your workplace, your relationship to your workplace, sort of refusing to make that personal, right? So for refusing to collapse it by being willing to be, to not be the best carer, right? Um, and so, how can you do something but not do it in an imagined full throttle way? And so I think about this with like setting boundaries around advising that I know we all have lots of demands in our time around it. And at once we see, because the structure that I do think like left discourse in the academy and the way we've organized it has been is that we care for our students and we care for those who are more precarious than us. And I try, have to tell myself my precarity won't solve a giant other structural precarity, which sounds like I'm being an ankle, right? But in other ways, what I'm saying is me constantly falling on the sword is continuing this untenable 
structure that is while it's eating me alive because I'm like, well, I need to be endlessly available on multiple days rather than being like, hey, these are my days for meetings and my times. And like, that's what I've got. And so um, being willing to not not just to not be viewed personally as the most caring person, um, as a colleague once uh, referred to it, especially, and she was a woman of color, but when you're a woman or a woman of color going up for tenure, she called it um, the need to be fucking delightful, which I loved, right, that she called, right? But being willing to be, to face the consequences, because there are real consequences, right? When you can, if you're in a place where you can, of not being seen as the, the most flexible, most caring, most whatever person in the ideal way. Um, and this is where I go back to Hill Malentino's concept of like, it sucks that we desire recognition so much and that's the condition of us needing care is that we, we all, I mean, and they're talking about trans folks, right? But we're really talking about the conditions of existence here, right? As in trans folks are setting the scene, right? For, and, 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 and um, that's a theory that I think is portable around recognition, which to say, how can we wrestle with our own need to be recognized as good feminists through our care? And um, our willingness to be seen instead as exhausted feminists, not because that's righteous, not because we are the most exhausted or the most precarious, because someone else will always win that battle as we look at global crises, you know, but because we are we are apportioning our exhausted pie, right? Um, and I say this and I struggle with it a lot, but I think a lot about what it would mean to be okay with not being the best feminist, i.e. the most caring in all concerns of all things. Yeah. And just to add two quick sentences before I know we have other questions. I think it's it's implicit in our talk, but important to make explicit that one of the ways that gender studies has secured its institutional visibility is by being like, one of the things that we do so well is we care for our students, right? And when, so Del Bauer in Women's Studies on its own makes the case that women's studies is the kind of academic second shift. And so what we might do our real time in philosophy or history or sociology, we do the real important care work by spending time with our majors, taking them to dinner, having peace, right? That's how we've, so one of the questions becomes how does women's studies, gender and sexuality studies, um, construct different narratives about our institutional importance that don't hinge on the care work that we provide our students. And then I think the other piece I'm thinking with Robin Wiegman's essay on married to the institution about how um, our university workplaces are often described of as, as analogous to families and to households. Right? And we that's often becomes the way that we think about academic life and the kind of the reprodu we, we reproduce ourselves with our students. Right. And so um, the problems of the household around the distribution of labor also become the problems of the academic workplace. And so thinking about what other kinds of um, narratives or metaphors we might deploy to think about the academic workplace apart from family. Thank you so much for that. Um, so I do have a, a bunch of questions from the audience. Um, I'm trying to condense some of them together. I think uh, one of the things that that is coming up a little bit uh, is intersectionality. And putting two two questions kind of together, um, the the kind of critiques of the way intersectionality has been used perhaps speak a little bit to that in relationship to abolition. Um, and the question is about, whether um, you see abolition going the same way as intersectionality, um, framed as the answer to, to everything. Uh, and yeah, just um, it, uh, anyone can jump in. Jen, do you want me to start this one? Sure. Um, and I think it's very interesting that they're paired together. And of course, you all are doing great work on the intersection of abolition and feminism, right, which are obviously intersecting in their very core, right, but thinking about how to do that since one of the most common refrains against abolition is what do you do with violence against women, right, and you all are trying to think through that. Um, 
and you see how much work and care it is and how much it relies on answers that are about um, having a community that is stepping in to um, protect, to hold accountable, to do all of these things that are exhausting and we have to ask who's going to do that work in the community, right? Again and again, um, even as we see that the police state isn't going to, you know, step in and and that offers a totally false sense of protection too, right? And yet one that that you can understand how exhausted um, survivors want, right? Uh, and so I'm really thinking a lot about how things get put into the mill of what um, is needs to be at that moment. And for those of us, and this is where I really do, um, Allie, when you were joking about feeling seen or not joking, right? I really do feel like once you've lived through generations in the academy, you see things come and go. And you could say it makes you jaded or cynical, but in other ways it makes you see that the imperative of the moment that feels so urgent is one line amongst many that you've seen the field take. And that doesn't mean you can't go toward the key term. It's that it's the imagination that it is exhaustive and it is always the answer and that the field needs to find the thing that is always the answer and accounts for both origin, explanation and future across all populations, which also tends to cause an oppression Olympics of like, well, if it doesn't work for X, it won't work for Y. And that's just not always the case, right? And there's been a lot of uh, work on that, particularly in um, ethnic studies in the 90s, right? And early aughts, uh, like Wendy Brown and um, uh, Ann Lynn Chang and uh, folks like that. So I just really want to think about um, this not as a taking to task the content of abolition or intersectionality, but the kind of will to be like, if you're not abolitionist, you are bullshit, right? To take that kind of term. And in our other field, Black studies, that's very much kind of the vibe as well, right? And it's actually really interesting thinking that alongside, if you're doing a diaspora of Black studies, alongside folks who don't live in any longer white supremacist states, I mean, we could all talk about neocolonialism, right? And the way that works, but what happens when that structure, right, isn't quite the same? How that kind of works out, right? And whether or not that's the paradigm that that works for everyone, right? It's also interesting when you think about like I have a fantastic colleague who's you know partner both both of them identify as black, right? Is a prosecutor, right? And so again, you think about like employment, and we talk a lot about um, in this country about um, uh, black and Latinx cops, right, and other things in the structure of white supremacy that is policing, right, but also thinking about the military and armed forces and police forces as places that offer uh, employment and benefits and a kind of um, way through for folks who often uh, don't have a way. And particularly when we think about black and brown masculinity in schooling and education, right? This is our access to sort of middle class jobs, right? That offer certain other kinds of protection. So again, I just really want to think about that, not to excuse one side of it or both sides it, but to say these are complicated terms that don't always work out the way we think they're going to um, in the moment. But Jen, you might have other things to offer. Yeah, that was awesome, Sam. Um, I mean, I think I think I, I take the question to um, gesture to the fact that both intersectionality and abolition uh, have this sort of elasticity and how they are mobilized as method and theory as practice and politics as ethic that they they are all of those things all at once often traveling um apart from particular citational genealogy so i was thinking of a moment 
I was on a dissertation committee with Leslie Harris, a historian at Northwestern, and she was like, I'm a historian of slavery. Abolition means something really particular to me. When you talk about it capaciously, I don't know what you mean, right? And so it was an interesting moment, um, as with intersectionality, to think about how the term has traveled. I do think, um, and I appreciate where you started, Sam, I think one of the interesting things, just to sort of tease apart these terms, um, one of the interesting things is when you get to the critical limits of abolition, and I think I'm te every semester I teach Janet Holly's work on affirmative consent, and we get to that moment where folks are like, but what do you do about sexual violence? And it, it, it throws, a, there's a crisis in the room, right? And so it's interesting to think about that. And I think it's also interesting to think about um, how abolition generates a different set of crises for feminism than intersectionality, because I think abolitionist thinkers, like take someone like Marquise Bay, are interested in having feminism undo our attachment to our central object, right? We are we are supposed to abolish gender, right? Um, and so I think it, it throws our field into a kind of existential crisis if our theoretical and political work is to eliminate the thing that we study. And I don't, I don't think intersectionality causes that set of existential crises. It causes a different set of crises. Um, and so, so I think, I think there are some key differences there. And then the last thing I'll say, and um, this conversation came up uh, the feminist theory workshop at Duke in March is it's interesting to be in a moment where so many on the left will use the phrase abolish the university, which means a whole host of different things to different folks, but that's the phrase that gets used. And folks on the right want to abolish the university, though in different ways and for different reasons. And so I think, um, at least at the feminist theory workshop, there was a real conversation about what it would mean for us feminists to actually invest in the university rather than to divest from it because all we see is the right gutting gender studies, sexuality studies, black studies, ethnic studies, and a real insistence that the university is, it, as we see, it is going to be the space of struggle in the next decade. So I think it, it for, for some of us in that, it, the feminist theory workshop, it led to a set of questions as to if abolition was the term that we wanted to use to think about how we wanted to transform the university. Ali, do we have time for one more? Yeah, I think one more. Okay. Thank you. If if you if you are okay with that, Jenna Sam, are you happy with one more? Yeah, lovely. Thank you. Okay, so so this one is is talking about the fracturing of feminist spaces, um, and and how in those spaces um, they can recreate harm. So no feminist space really being inclusive, um, the magic place doesn't exist. Um, in the UK, looking at feminist academic spaces and trade unions being targeted from within by transphobia, uh, and maybe speaking a little bit to how we can recover from this. Uh, and, and then I just wanted to shoehorn a little question um, that I've been thinking about throughout um, around intergenerational exhaustion and how exhausted the feminists that are in the encampments, you know, um, out at the universities are, are learning a new kind of exhaustion. Um, and if you wanted to just speak to that a little bit, but yeah. Yeah, I can, I, those are great questions. Um, you know, I think the, the question of, um, Inclusivity is, I think for me, or it's a it's a super complicated question, right? Because I think, and I think this is what we're trying to gesture at in our comments about intersectionality, that I think one of the the hopes pinned onto intersectionality is that it would forge a feminism that could do everything, um, that could that it, that could think about all forms of domination and all structures of power simultaneously. And you know what, like this is a crude way of saying it, we would all feel seen. And we would all feel seen, but it would also be a feminism that was always rooted in and oriented towards the experiences of the most marginalized, as though we could all determine who the most marginalized are in any single moment when we probably can't. Probably marginality is more complicated than that. And I think what what we know, what I what I know is that um, feminism is not is not going to be able to do. We can't do that. Right? Like that's that's why I think that's what we're gesturing towards with intersectionality. Um, generating a certain kind of fatigue, which doesn't mean that it shouldn't be an ideal, right? I do want to separate this or an ethic. Um, but I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm just interested in the the kind of fiction or fantasy that we will ever have a feminist space that is capacious enough to hold us all, which might also be a way of saying that there is no way of doing our theory or our politics that isn't harmful. 
which isn't necessarily a bad thing, right? Like harm is part of relationality. We know that. So I want to hold that. Um, I, so so that's, the, that's the first thing. And then I think the intergenerational question is a really important one. And I don't have an answer to it, but I do want to think about how important for feminists, for better or for worse, the logic of generation has been destructuring how we think. It has become the primary way that we think about telling time. Um, and sometimes we do it cynically. I'm thinking here with Claire Hemmings about the stories that we tell, which are really generational stories um, and what it might mean for us to, in her words, tell stories differently that upend that way of, of telling time. And I mean, I think especially now, so many conversations I have with, say, my dad about the current moment or my dad saying things like, this is 1968. This is when I was in college. This is so from the, and so thinking about models of time that are, um, that are not linear, that are, that think about how time folds back on itself, really interrupt this idea of, of, of generationality as the way to structure how we tell them those stories. Sam, I don't know if you want to jump in. I just want to add um, in the way that, you know, Jen, you totally brought up marriage to the institution, but I was going to be like, but wait, also that um, is, um, you know, I, uh, it's no surprise to anyone who's read anything I've done that I'm obsessed with Bernice Johnson Reagan's um, essay on coalition, where she talks a lot about how it should feel dangerous to leave the room. Now we can talk about the structuring logic where the same people, right, are feeling precarious in all kinds of, of spaces, including left spaces, which is largely what we're talking about with our archive, which is not just not feeling safe because capitalism, white supremacy, et cetera, but like not feeling good about the care work you're doing within your own you know, community of affinity, left affinity. And so it's not, this is not a sort of like, we're tired, right? So trans folks who aren't being recognized in terms of a labor, um, good questions about labor and um, worker identity within a trade union, like, no, like we, we need to work on that, right? Um, the question is how we work on that, right? So you can understand Right, obviously the history of unionization and class in the UK, for instance, right, um, to make certain claims, right? And Chris Hansman's book that's about um, trans health and trans care talks about, you know, using the rhetoric of the medical establishment to kind of create spaces, right? So using the rhetoric of informed consent, which is a super problematic category, which he knows, right? And it, and and so he he's saying like, okay, but this is how it gets mobilized, right? And now we're critique. We see the way the long tail of that is a problem, like with abortion, right? Like arguing about it as choice and privacy doesn't work out all that great long term. But more, it's to say that rhetoric has been remobilized, and now we need a different frame, right? And so I'm thinking a lot about the ways that we can both still demand justice, and I think this is exactly what we're talking about with, with exhaustion, without claiming totalizing rightness and righteousness across all time and space. Because as I often tell my students when I'm teaching Women's and Gender Studies 101, I, I say that my thesis is feminism is about change. It could be that feminism is about exhaustion, right? And then I say, whatever we think the horizon of, of rightness will always move. So try to speak humbly as in, hi friend, that I, you know, screw up every day as a feminist, right? Um, uh, but also that I've watched my feminism change, right? Um, and this came up with a lot of things. Like I remember when the um, gun violence protests of many now, right? But right after the Parkland shooting in the US happened, People were critiquing, you know, the 17 year olds for not being intersectional enough or whatever. And like Keanu Amata Taylor totally was like, um, have you ever like organized anything and learned from organizing? Like tried to be like, do we have room for people to change? And I, I worry about left purity politics around origins being like, you know, it's either this or nothing. And I understand that. And I feel it and I was, I was that before, right? And I don't mean to say that I'm the progress narrative. And in fact, I think we're trying to theorize 
age here, like the age of feminism, the aging of terms, and what it means to be institutionally rooted now versus what it meant to be, try to be, establish yourself in an institution in 1968 and to recognize that there's similarities, but there's also big differences around reproduction of the field and ourselves. Thank you both so much. Um, and thank you, Tina, for your stellar job in collating all those questions. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a lot that we didn't get to answer. Um, I'm sorry. I don't know whether it will save them after the webinar's over, but um, if it does, I will pass them on to you. Um, thanks to everybody for coming. And I'm going to stop the recording now. I wish we could give you a round of applause in person, um, but have a virtual one from me. Ha, ha, ha.